The next talk will be Michele Bertoli. <laughs> hey, I can pronounce a few things. So the next talk will be about set state machine. Uh, one thing you should know is that, first of all, yes, uh, Tracy did beat Ken Wheeler in a, a wrestling match yesterday. The winner got to be keynote. The loser had to go last today, so that's why Ken's going to be the last person to speak. And uh, one thing about Michele is that he always complains about food. Uh, he's the worst Yelp reviewer of all. Everybody ready? Are you good? All right. Please give a warm welcome to Michele. Uh, yeah. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Michele, and I love React. Um, I work in ads at Facebook, and I build a product called the Creative Hub. What I learned in my, in my career is that state management, especially when building UI, is pretty hard. As, as engineers, we have to uh, keep track of the state changes over time, and we have to make sure that users can only perform a valid set of operations at any given point in time. And I was wondering if this complexity is intrinsic in building UI. There is nothing we can do about it, or actually, like, there are some solution to it. And because maybe we use the wrong approach. And I'm going to show you an example, like the infinite scroll. I assume everyone has a rough idea how the infinite scroll works. And uh, there are different ways you can solve this problem. Uh, I picked like, the simplest one. But what I want you to concentrate on is the, is the approach that we're going to take, because m m that might be, there might be a problem on the approach. So if we were to build an infinite scroll component, the first thing we would do, we would attach an event handler to the scroll. Uh, every time this uh, scroll event fires, we would check whether the user scrolled more than 90% of the page. And if that's the case, uh, we fetch more data and we append the new data uh, at the end of the page. Like so far, so good, I guess. Uh, uh, so if we implemented this, uh, this component, like this would be the core functionality, right? We calculate the scroll percentage. If the scroll percentage is more than 90%, we fetch new data. However, this has a problem. Uh, in fact, uh, we are going to fetch in with this code, we would fetch more uh, than expected, because the scroll event keeps on firing when we started fetching already. Uh, again, there are different solutions. One of the uh, like most common is using a state flag. Uh, so we would set uh, is fetching to true when we start fetching. And then when the scroll event fires, we check whether the user scrolled more than 90%, and also if we are not fetching already. And if we are fetching already, we just ignore the event. Uh, this is not a big issue, but, but now our component does two different things, when something when it's fetching and something when it's not fetching. And the same applies to the, to the render of this component. So you start adding a ternary, and you say, if it's fetching, then you can uh, show a loading indicator, a spinner, whatever. Otherwise, not. And again, but uh, this works. Like The component has two states. It's fine. However, uh, when, if we implement this and we try it, we soon figure out that when we reach the final page, we keep on fetching. So there is no way for us to stop fetching when, when, when there are no more pages. So, if you suppose that your data returns an object that has this has more uh, attribute, you can use this attribute to, for example, detach the, the event handler. So now you're doing three things. When it's not fetching, when it's fetching, and when there is no more data. And we forgot to think about errors. So if we want to deal with errors as well, like here we go, has error flag. Uh, so we now have four flags. And if we think about like a retry functionality, this is going to go on and on and on and on. And this can go even worse. This example is taken from the Redux repo, the async example. No blame on the author. I write code like this every day. Uh, but we use uh, state flags here, uh, like nested ternaries of state flags. So if the component is empty, we could either be fetching, and in that case, we show a loading indicator, or, we, or it's actually empty. And if it's not empty, we show the post. You got the point, right? State flags are over, all, over, all over the place. And this approach, uh, where you start solving a simple problem, and then you find out all the edge cases, and you add on top of it, is called the bottom-up approach. 
And the bottom-up approach is where you focus on linear transitions. As we said, it's going to A, B, C, like event handler, 90%, fetch more data. Uh, you very soon realize that you need context. So it's not just about, on this event, I'm going to perform this action. It's more like, on this event, if I'm not fetching, if there is no error, if I'm not retrying, then uh, uh, I'm going to fire this action. So you need context. And usually, this bottom-up approach also uh, generates code that is harder to understand. If you think about the nested ternary, it's not trivial to say what's going on there. And it's also complex to scale because, um, and, and maintain. Because if you, if you want to uh, uh, manage a new state, for example, is retrying, let's say, you have to make sure that you protect all the existing branches against this new state flag. And it's not trivial looking at all the state flags of a component saying what's going on, because state flags can be combined. So it's up to you to make sure that one is true, the other is false. But uh, you can generate new state, new unpredictable states that, that obviously uh, lead to bugs. So in the last six months, uh, I spent most of my free time uh, uh, think, uh, like playing around with state machines, uh, because as the name implies, uh, they should be a good way to manage the state, right? And since my friend Ellie told me that she didn't pay attention at, the, at her university class about state machines, I'm going to go through the basics, uh, just one slide, uh, just to make sure we are all on the same page. So uh, this, the automata theory is the uh, studies the, is these abstract machines and the problems that they can solve. Uh, they are able to recognize like finite languages, and they are used, for example, for regular expressions. And there are different types of state machines. Uh, there is, for example, the Turing machine, which is an infinite number of states. Uh, hopefully, our user interfaces have a finite number of states. That's what we hope for. And it's also deterministic. So we are interested in the deterministic finite automata, which has a couple of interesting properties. Uh, it has one state at time, so no more like is empty and is fetching at the same time. And also, given uh, the current state and, and uh, an input, is always going to give the next state, which is what we're gonna, we want to give to our users as well, hopefully. And the cool thing about state machine is, is you can define them using these uh, five elements. So there is a pretty clean way to define a, a machine. So Q is the set of all the states that the machine can have. Sigma is the set of all the different input, inputs that the machine is going to accept. Uh, uh, delta is the function that, given a state and an input, is going to give you the next state. Q0 is the initial state, and F is the final state. And another thing about, cool thing about state machines is that you can use state transition diagrams to visually represent them. And this is a super simple state machine. Uh, you have hey, which is the initial state, because it has this arrow with a circle. On the input alpha, it transitions to B. On the input beta, it transitions to C, which is the final state, because there's this double circle. And you may wonder, what does this have to do with UIs? Uh, so suppose we are building a user interface to configure Prettier. And Prettier, if you know what it is, it's a super cool tool to format your code. And it has uh, a, an option that uh, allows you to enable and disable semicolons. And if you are uh, designing the behavior of a button that toggles this option, you're going to have a state machine like this. So the initial state is semicolons. Then you toggle it, the button, and it goes into the snow semicolon state. You toggle it again, and it goes back to semicolons. It would be pretty cool if we could define all of our user interface uh, using these this state transition diagrams, right? However, we can't. Because as soon as we add a second option, for example, space or tabs, uh, we're going to have to create one state for each one of the combinations of these options. So in this case, you would have four states. This is also the most controversial state machine ever created. We could argue like around this for, for years, because you can have semicolons and spaces, semicolons and tabs, no semicolons and tabs, and so on and so forth. So it doesn't scale. If you think about adding a third option, like for example, single quotes or double quotes, you're going to have nine states, and the number of states is going gonna, gonna to explode. So 
That's where state charts uh, come to rescue. And state charts is a visual formalism for complex system. They've been defined in the 1987 by David Arrell in, this, in, this, in, a, in a paper. And it's basically an extension of the, uh, conventional form, uh, on the conventional formalism of state machines and state transition diagram, what we have seen before. Basically, it solves the problem that I just showed you. And I'm going to go through like the main features of this paper, like to show you what, what, what problems it's going to solve, and then we're going to see how we can implement this in, in code. Suppose you have this machine. So from A, uh, it transitions to B on the input alpha, but both A and B go to C on the transition beta. So you have two arrows with the same input and the same destination. And these are just two, but you could have a transition diagram with like 1,000 of these arrows. You can create a compound com state and, and, and just wrap A and B and say, no matter if you are in A or B, it's always going to go to C on, on beta. And this is going to solve a, a, an issue, like makes this um, uh, chart like way cleaner. And you can also zoom out a bit and give this compound state a name, so D, for example. So you're saying D from D on the input beta, it goes to C. And, and this is pretty cool because you can assume that every state has also a state machine inside. You can have nested state machines. The second feature is orthogonality, which allows you to have a, a parallel state machines. So, for example, in this machine, you can have uh, the state can be A and C at the same time. And these two machines, separated by a dotted line, can have their own state at the same time. So if you go back to the prettier example, you could have a machine for the uh, semicolons, a machine for the spaces and tabs, another machine for uh, the um, single and double quotes without having the number of states uh, explode. Uh, another feature is guards, which are basically conditions. So you, you're still going to have conditions, but you have conditions only on transition. So you don't have to check if the, state, if the machine is in the state A or B, because the, mach the machine knows that. Uh, you can guard a, a transition with, 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 a, with a condition. So for example, this machine is going to transition from A to B on the event, only if the guard is true. And the guard, you put the guard into the square brackets. Now, last concept is actions. It's the most important thing. It's mind-blowing. It's where it makes state charts a really great candidate for, for managing your state of your UIs. So an action is basically the output of the state chart. It's just a label that you put in your state charts. And, and when a transition happens, like this, the output of the state chart is this label of this action. And you put this action uh, after this uh, forward slash. So when this machine transitions from A to B on the event, the output is going to be action. You can have actions when you enter a state and when you exit a state as well. So when you enter the state A, the action is going to be action one. And when you exit the state A, the action is going to be action two and three. So basically, the workflow when you work with state charts is you send an event to the state chart. The state chart knows its state. It evaluates all the guards. It checks whether a transition needs to happen. And if it happens, it uh, collects all the action exiting the current state, all the actions on transitions, all the actions on entering the new state. And it's going to give you a bunch of actions. And you have to do something about this. To quote Luca, which he wrote a great article on using state charts with Redux. Check it out. Uh, I met him on Twitter talking about state charts as well. He has this great analogy. He says, a state chart is a magic box. You tell it what happened, and it tells you what to do. But now I talked for like almost 20 minutes about theoretical stuff. You want to see some code, right? So let's do it. Uh, you first install uh, xState. You are not xState. xState is an awesome library to design state machines and state charts with, with JavaScript. It's also functional and stateless. And we're going to build this machine, the uh, pretty machine. So you start from the semicolon state. When you toggle it, you go to semi no semicolon state and back to semicolon state. And we have actions now. So when we enter the semicolon state, the action is going to be add semicolons. And when we exit the, uh, sorry, when we enter the no semicolon state, the action is going to be remove semicolon. So now it should be clearer to you what actions are. Basically labels that, labels that describe what should happen when the machine enters that state. So we're just going to send the machine the toggle event, and the machine is going to give us a you now should add semicolons. You now should remove semicolons. 
the first thing we need to do is to uh, define this machine in a way that X state can understand it. And so you define it using this JSON object that you pass to the machine function. And we generate this pretty machine that has the initial state is semi, semicolons. And then you define the different states. And each one of the states look like this. So the semicolon state on the toggle event, it goes to no semicolons. And the on entry action is going to be add semicolons. Similarly, from no semi to semicolons, and the action is going to be remove semicolon. This format is pretty similar to the state chart XML, which is maintained by the W3C. Is that, that, that one is it's, uh, XML. This is JSON. Uh, but David, the author of XState, is working on a, on a way to convert like, one format to, to the other. But yeah, when we have this machine, this pretty machine, we can do this. We can do pretty machine dot transition given the semi state and the toggle event is going to give you back an object that represents the new state and the new state is going to be no semicolons and uh, the output is going to have these actions uh, property which is the list of the action that you have to run so if you go if you are in the semicolon state so semicolons are enabled and you just toggle it the action is going to be remove semicolon so you have to do something about it what should you do about it now i'm going to show you and what about react as well I built a library called React Automata. Uh, it's pretty simple, so you can play around with it or like build your own, uh, which basically is a layer on top of XState that lets you uh, manage your state uh, within React uh, using a state under the hood. It's an abstraction for state machines. And we're going to build something more like cool. Uh, uh, for example, uh, we're going to build, uh, we're going to go back to the example of the, of the infinite scroll. So you can see how the infinite scroll functionality looks like in a state chart. So you have the start state, which is your initial state, and the entry action is attached. Because the first thing we want to do is attaching the event listener. When we are ready, we send the ready event to the machine, the machine is going to go in the fetching state. And the entry action is fetch, because the first thing we want to do is fetching the first page. If the fetching succeeds, we're going to go to the listening state. Only you see that there is a guard there. And there is the has more property that our like, API endpoint is going to return an object with this property has more, which we pass to the state chart that can evaluate. And it's going to transition to listening only if has more is, uh, is true. If uh, when, when we are listening, we, we are keep on sending the scroll event, but you see the, we have this condition. We are going to go in the fetching state only if the scroll percentage is greater than 90%. So we keep on sending scroll event, but the machine knows when it's time to actually transition to fetch again. And this loops is going to go through un until you have pages. At some point, as more is going to be false, and you're going to transition to finish. And at that point, the entry action is going to be detached. So you have to detach the the event handler. And if there is an error, you just go back to listening. So this is a state chart for an infinite scope. How do you use it? First of all, you describe this state chart with, with, with X state, and you pass it as well as a, 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 together with a component to the with state chart higher order component that React Automata uh, provides. But let's see how, how, we should, how, how it works. So we enter in the start state. And the entry action is going to be attached. So the question is, how do we do something? We want to react to this action uh, that the state chart is going to give us. So you just define an action, a method, sorry, in the component uh, that has the same name of the action. And React Automata is going to fire it at the right moment in time. The attach would look like this. For example, you use the reference to an element to attach the event handler. OK, when the attach uh, is done, so we are listening to the scroll event, uh, we want to tell the machine that we are ready. We are ready to start fetching. And so how do we send a ready transition to the, to the machine? We just use the transition uh, function that we receive from the props from the uh, higher order component with the label of the input that we want to give to the machine. Cool. So now something a little bit more complicated. Uh, when the ready event is done, the machine is going to transition to fetching. And the entry action is fetch. So we want to, first of all, react to it. And this is going to be an asynchronous function. So if we succeed, we want to tell the machine that like, we want to fire the success event. And if there is an error, we want to tell the machine that there is an error. And first of all, we have to add a method with that as the same name of the action, just that. And, and React Automata is going to fire it at the right moment in time. 
the implementation of this thread would be something like this. You extract the transition function from, from the props, and then you use this load data, which is a, like a, a function that loads the data from the APIs, returns the promise. When the promise succeeds, you uh, pass the data together. You, you transition passing the event name and the data as well. Because a cool thing about state charts is that you put the condition in the, in the state chart. So it's the state chart that evaluates the condition. You don't have to do anything. You don't have to tell the state chart if there is more data. You just pass this data object, and the state chart is going gonna, is gonna to evaluate the condition for you. If there is an error, we transition to, to error. So the workflow when you use React Automata is even simpler. Like it's one level, level uh, above. So you just send transitions to the state chart with an event and some data. React Automata uses X state under the hood to calculate the current state, the next state, all the actions, and it fires all the action methods for you. You don't have to do like you don't have to think about that. The higher order component also accepts a, a second uh, parameter, which is options. And if you set dev tools to true, then it's going to connect the state machine to the Redux dev tool extension. So you can have like super cool uh, debugging functionalities like time travel, because it's pretty similar to, to Redux in a way, where you have the state and you have the events that muted the state. It also gives you these um, action components. So you can say, I want to show these children of this component only when the fetch action happens. So it's basically a conditional that makes like, things a little bit cleaner in your, in your uh, render method. Now, if you were here last year, I quoted myself uh, saying that the best testing strategy is not writing tests. I'm going to quote myself again because I strongly believe in this. And I don't mean that you don't have your code base tested. I mean that whenever you can have tests for free, then you should go for it. Uh, and what I, uh, when I heard for the first time about state charts and state machine, I thought, hey, if we know all the states and all the transitions in advance, then tests could be automatically generated. And this was the test state chart uh, method from React Automata does. You just pass a state chart and a component. You can also pass optional fixtures if you want to inject data. And this is going to calculate all the simple paths from, uh, paths from the start um, state to all the other states. And it's going to move the component to all these states. And when uh, the component is in each one of these states, it's going to take a snapshot. And a snapshot, if you don't know what it is, check it out. It's a super cool feature provided by Jess, which is a test framework for JavaScript. And it's basically um, like a, the output of the render method, uh, like serialized in a human readable way. And, and so with this, just with this method, you're going to have a snapshot in each one of the states of the state chart for free. So for example, uh, in the fetching state, this is going to be the snapshot, the loading indicator. In the error state, this is going to be the snapshot. Something went wrong. And this is the, so you're going to have a bunch of snapshots for free. And, and I think this is, this is pretty cool. So what are the benefits uh, when, uh, when you use state charts to manage your state? So the first one, you're going to have fewer bugs. And it's not me. Like, yeah, I read a book about this and, uh, by Ian Oroks, and he made an experiment. He split a team into two, and one part of the team was using state chart to build the software application, and another part of the team wasn't. And, and the part of the software that uh, was using state chart had 80% less bugs. It's easy to understand because you have this visual way to represent your state that you can even share like, with the rest of your team, not just the engineers. Like designers, for example, they're, uh, they're using already state charts when they design the user flow. And finally, you separate what happens, which are all the methods that you define in your component with when it happens. When it happens is up to the state chart. So you define when things happen in the state chart, and you define what happens in your, in your component. And they are also decoupled, because your component is just going to react to actions that the state chart is going to give. So you can change, easily change the states in the state charts and adding new states and new transitions, and your application still, still works. Max Stoiber, the creator of style components as well as uh, Spectrum Chat, he, may, he, he, he knows how state charts work. He played around with React Automata as well, and he made a prediction. Everyone is, everybody's going to use state charts, state machines for UIs. I'm doing my best here to have this prediction become true. Uh, 
if you want to see an example of this, I built this calculator at this nice URL here. Uh, basically, a calculator is seems a trivial application. I don't know if you ever built one, but it turns out it's not. And also, it's a, the kind of application where you need a lot of state flags. Because when a user enters a number, you want to know if they enter the number for the first operand, the second operand, or if the number that they enter is before or after the decimal point. And I built this calculator with no if statements, no state flags, only guards in the state chart. So go check it out if you are interested. Takeaways. Think about states more than transitions. If you use Redux, for example, you tend to think about actions. So you think about all the different actions that mutate your state. While with state charts, you think more about the different states that your component can have. You can call them modes. And then you just connect them with transitions. And this helps quite a lot. In fact, even though I'm not using uh, state charts uh, on a daily basis yet, uh, I completely changed my approach, the approach I, I build components. And in fact, I'm using a top-down approach now, where I think about all the states, all the inputs, you know, the, 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 the um, set of states, set of inputs, set of transitions. And this is going to help me quite a lot. Obviously, a downside of it is that you're going to spend quite a lot of time uh, thinking about how your components work before writing them. But then you can just switch your brain off when you, when you write code. And you should do it only if you use state charts. And, and read more papers, because like papers that the truth. This one for, was from the 1987. And, and still, it's, very, like, it's, a, it's a great candidate like, to build your UIs and manage your, your state. So these are the reference to the paper, uh, uh, bit.li uh, state charts dash paper, and to the book that uh, I mentioned. Uh, this book really inspired this talk uh, uh, as well. It's a great book. Go check it, check it out. And finally, I just wanted to say thanks to, thanks to Fede, which talked about me with the, about state machines for the first time like um, almost six months ago. And he ruined my life, basically, uh, <laughs> because I spent all of my time on this. Um, thanks, Fede. Uh, David, which is the author of XState, and he's also giving awesome talks about, about this topic as well. Ryan is the creator of React Router. He played around with XState and React for the first time, and I was really, really excited about that. Eric is writing documentation around state charts. So statecharts.github.io. Go check it out if you are interested. And thank to every one of you like to listen to me. Uh, I hope this was useful, inspiring. Please reach out to me later. I can talk about React and state charts for hours, even at the AP hour. I'm going to still talk about, about React. Thank you very much.